Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of our program. This is Mike Saunders with Marketing Huddle. Today, we're privileged to have with us Andy Paul with Zero Time Selling. Welcome to the program, Andy. Hey, thank you, Mike. Hey, so let's just jump right on in with today's topic of sales, and I'm sure, sure. that um, this is just a, a such a vast and broad topic, and I like to start off by saying, uh, boy, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what led you to this, and many times it is a matter of, well, you know, I stunk so bad in sales one day, and when I figured out how to conquer it, that's when I started helping other people, or I've always been, it's always been easy, so I thought I'd help other people, so it's interesting to hear that background. Well, it's really a combination of both. I mean, I started off and it stunk, and I eventually got good, <laughs> got good at it. Nice. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was, I was not, your, not your typical sales candidate when I had my first professional sales job out of, out of college. I'm you know, sort of an introvert, and uh, at the time that I was coming into sales, the model was that you really need to be sort of the stereotypical, outgoing, and I hate to use this term, but sort of quote-unquote stereotypical used car salesman type, type effect. And sure. uh, yeah, my early first sales training course I went to, um, the instructor, I was with a company called Burroughs, which is a big computer company at the time. It's now Unisys. And the sales, the sales training instructor basically told my manager they probably should fire me because I was too analytical for sales. Mm. Um, so it, uh, yeah, I, I didn't fit the mold at that time. So I, yeah, I did come up with ways to sort of carve my own path and come up with my own way of doing things that perhaps were not right in line with what, uh, you know, sort of the thought of the day was, but, you know, it turned out to be successful. And I worked uh, through my career before starting my own company. I worked for about six or seven different uh, startup companies and some that became quite successful. And, and one of the things that, that sort of two recurring themes in my career have been one is that oftentimes brought into companies when they were stuck and they mm. needed to be able to move forward. And I had some expertise in that. And, and secondly, it was working with companies that were small companies selling really mission critical type products to big companies. So we were competing against companies that had established track records and, and brand names. And we we're having to compete in that environment with no track record, no brand name and win business. And, you know, we learned how to do that. And so that became sort of another area of expertise that when I started my own company, I worked with with clients on as a how to help them get unstuck and and how to really compete in in competitive marketplaces. That's uh, that's awesome. I love that, and it made me think of something when you said analytical being um, uh, not a good thing from your that sales trainer. Well, I would wonder and submit to you that that when used properly has been a really big lever of success in your in your business moving forward because if you can balance it out you have to be analytical to see what worked in this sales situation what didn't work and then the numbers don't lie and and I'm sure that you have this as one of your basic 101 trainings you know boy if you go for this many calls you're certainly going to make this many appointments and certainly going to make this so the analytical side has to come out um can you speak to how to balance that out well, yeah, I mean, that the analytical really, really manifested itself in a different way other than, and certainly, you know, being data driven as increasingly stays as these days as the data become more data becomes available about your selling process and so on. Definitely you need to use it. But what I was referring to in those days was that is that I was curious about what the customer was confronting, the issues they had, the challenges they had, the, the goals they wanted to achieve. So, Whereas today, it's fairly common for people to be trained about, well, hey, lead with questions. I mean, at that time, it certainly wasn't. At that time, it was all about getting past the gatekeeper and making your pitch, where I was a little different at that time. I had this natural inclination to always lead with questions. And I, I've embodied that in a, um, you know, sort of a formula and a, a process that I teach and work with clients on is, is what I call the ask, don't tell formula which is saying that every time you have an opportunity when you're in front of the prospect to state something about your product or, or you know, to talk, is ask a question instead. Mm. 
you know, inst instead of saying, oh, gosh, I've got this great feature that does A, B, C, D, is turn around and ask the customer, well, what, what would be the impact on your business if you could do A, B, C, D? And what would the value be for you if you could do that? And that's completely different. You've suddenly gone from making it all about you, sort of showing up and throwing up all the facts and so on, until you've turned around and you've the customer. And to me, that's the analytical portion because you're, you're curious about what they're doing and what you can do to come up with the best solution for them. Yeah, exactly. And also, I would say that that questioning uh, approach is a little bit more um, in-depth and strategic than most questioning approaches. I would say that you get, you know, the typical, here's the 10 questions to ask, or the Harvey McKay 66, or things like that. And what you described was something where you're kind of leading the conversation to get the outcome that you're looking for, and they're answering the questions, and you're going, exactly. And so what would that lead you to? And they answer that, exactly. So here's our solution. Yeah, well, in fact, it's, it's what you find is that when you take that approach to, to questioning and say, okay, well, maybe there's, there's four or five key points to start a meeting planning. So there's four or five key points we really want to make sure the customer understands. Well, the best way to make sure they understand is not to ask us questions, you know, do you understand that we do this, but ask, you know, ask the question about what would be the value to you if you could do something like this. And yeah. then what that does, that starts a process where you start, you start collaborating, right? Because they say, oh, yeah, that could be interesting. And, and if we could also do this, you say, yeah, well, that would be really interesting to add, too. In the meantime, what they're doing is they're basically telling themselves exactly what it is that you do and the value that you offer. And so it starts and to doesn't more. That also, it starts to um, it, go ahead. Well, as I say, then through that collaborative what, process, what it really these days in sales we call co-creation, you know, you're, you're coming up with that solution together. And the customer has some ownership in it, then you've got some ownership in it. And and to me, that's the ultimate open-ended questioning process because you're, you're taught in sales from day one, you know, don't ask yes or no questions because they can say yes or no. And then where does that leave you? So well, asking yes. those kind of questions really opens up the door so, to get them talking. You know, when they answer in the affirmative, it, it creates some trust and rapport. So I, I, I really like that that um, approach as well. Yeah, and it, you brought up two key points, is trust and rapport. And you know, you have very few opportunities to create a positive impression in the mind of the prospect. And, and there's been some books uh, released, one particular recently talked about the whole science of creating first impressions and positive first impressions in the minds of people you meet. And the fact is this process takes place very quickly. Uh, I did in my most recent book uh, titled Amp Up Your Sales, I, I talk in some depth about research that's come out about how quickly people make up their minds about you. In fact, mm. there's some science that says that uh, people form their first perceptions of you within a quarter of a second, a first meeting, or 250 mm. milliseconds, I mean, the, the time it takes to blink an eye. And so knowing that that's somewhat the case, what people are looking for in these first impressions when they're being formed is they're trying to answer two questions as one is, you know, can I trust this person and, and B, is this person competent to help me? basically. And they answer the trust question first. And so one of the best ways to build trust is not to come in and talk about yourself, but to come in and show a sincere interest in the other person. Yeah. And you yeah, do that you're question. Exactly right. And, and, and I think when you are coming at it from a question base, but also when you can integrate in an educational approach, you're perceived as um, an expert, um, a trustworthy expert, and as someone that's not coming right at you going, here's our coupon, buy, buy, buy. You know, they're looking at you as a resource because um, re recently I interviewed uh, someone on my show from a company called Purchase Green, and they sell artificial grass. And their entire model is based on um, that same process. And I said to the VP of, of uh, uh, business development on the show, I said, yeah, have you ever heard of Chet Holmes and the ultimate sales machine? And he's like, that's exactly where we based all of our approach from. And, and when people come into their showroom, they they almost have to, to um, get it to request and grab them by the lapel and say, please sell me something because their reps are trained to say, let me just explain this. Let me just show you how this, let me just tell you the differences between. And so they can understand in their own mind how to make a decision. And then the obvious choice should be these guys have good prices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But boy, I understand that now. And the other people were just kind of going, here's what we have. So 
how how do you feel that the question based slash um, um, uh, um, you know just just that that process of education integrates together? Well, I think hand in hand. So I think that that if you can, there's a difference between just having scripted questions and mm-hmm. really understanding and having some some empathy and connection with with the customer, the prospect when they come in. And so oftentimes you do have situations, unfortunately, where salespeople are, are overly scripted and you can tell they're just reading the questions as opposed to having internalized them. And, but if you can get your reps trained with just a handful of sort of key questions that start the conversation, that the key is really to have your reps understand what the next question they should ask is. And so this is really sort of the next level of training is saying, you know, it's not the quality of the first question. It's really the quality of the question you ask in response to the mm-hmm. customer's response. And because that's going to say, okay, I know where to take this conversation. I know where how to guide the customer. And you're going to guide them through the questions you ask. And I, I give an example to people. Yes, uh, once I, I do sort of a, a, a odd form of, of sales presentation training. And I, I believe that the best sales presentation you can make is just a series of questions because if you have the right questions that you're asking at the end of your meeting with the customer, they're going to know exactly what your product and service does, but they're going to understand it from a value standpoint as opposed to a facts and figures standpoint. So to me, the ideal sales presentation, just as, as you talked about uh, the gentleman you interviewed on the show, it's just going to be a series of questions and through the answers the customer provides, they are going to understand exactly what your product and service does. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Hey, you know, you, you can't go anywhere online without seeing some ad or promotion about sales automation. Um, mm-hmm. And so what my, I mean, I love it. I love things that will automate tasks. Now, the scary thing is machines will take over the world. No, because you still <laughs> got to know what to do and what to program and what actions to take. It can only um, serve it up on a silver platter. And then one of the clients I was work, working with just last week, I, I showed them an automation I set up for them where when someone fills out this form online, it then creates this and sets this and creates an activity. I said, here's the deal. It does everything but call them up and pitch your product, but that's your job. And so what do you feel about about sales automation as it compares to that personal touch, talking to a human being belly to belly? I don't think, I don't think that in the main that we're ever going to get rid of the belly to belly conversation. In fact, that's really where you differentiate yourself from your competitors. Mm. And so those companies that are quick to sort of dispense with that, and some are uh, for certain types of products and services, I think they're making a mistake. I think that you, you're going to get much better results if you have that human-to-human interaction at some point in time in the sales process. Now, there are certain products where you know the customers can learn so much about the product or service online that that and we've seen classes of products where people buy completely online that they used to go <laughs> go to. I mean, look at shoes, right? We always used to buy our shoes in a store. Now most of us buy our shoes online or some portion of them. <laughs> um, but there are always going to be products, especially in the business-to-business space, where where the sales rep, the salesperson, needs to be able to add some value, and the customer really wants that that interaction to help them make the decision, make the choice. So you have to really be focused on have you trained your reps to a sufficient level where they can add value to the prospect during their buying process. And that's really the acid test, is if, if the customer looks at the rep and says, well, they can't tell me anything more than I've already found out online, then you're going to see those, those reps be automated out of, out of business, out of a job. But I think that, I think that, yep. that doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, because, again, it's really, it's really your fault as a seller if you let that happen. Yeah, you know, um, I, I agree a thousand percent. I think there needs to be that balance between tech tools and, and automation and the personal touch. Um, I feel that having the automation tools enhance it to bring it uh, uh, together quicker. And, and here's what oh, yeah. I uh, mean by that. So we've all tried to connect with someone for a phone call or a personal meeting and email them and go, hey, let's meet next Tuesday for coffee. And the response comes back, ooh, I've already got a meeting. How about Thursday at you know 9 a.m.? Nope, I've got a meeting. How about for – and so when you can use some automation tools like um, online scheduling, and there's many out there, but then sure. where it shows up your schedule and it shows only what you're available, and that person then can click on and go, oh, 
I can meet Thursday at 2. Okay, good. Click, book it. Everybody, both parties get the confirmation. So I would say that there's wonderful automation tools like that that allow you to facilitate that belly-to-belly. Oh, absolutely. And there's, there's increasingly sophisticated and complex tools coming out for automating you know, significant portions of what people call the sales cadence. So as Salesforce becomes increasingly specialized in their roles, we're seeing this dual role development within a lot of sales teams where there's the outbound prospecting reps called sales development reps and then the account execs that are basically the, the ones that'll take it from a qualified lead through to the close. And in that whole sales development prospecting prospect, yeah, there's, there's a, a wealth of new tools that have come out that really help automate a lot of the sort of mundane tasks in terms of uh, you put together, you define a, a sequence or what we call a cadence of contacts to try to reach out to the prospect and a combination of phone calls and emails and social touches. And you, yeah, you can queue those up. You can initiate them. If you're sitting at a computer and you're in a headset, they'll pop up a call onto your screen. They just click a button to initiate a call. The prospect's not there. You can leave an automated voicemail. And having done that, then maybe your next step in your sequence you automated was that if you don't hear back from the prospects in 24 hours, you send them an email to follow up. And you can automate multiple touches, but at the end of that, at some point, what's going to happen is if you do get hold of that prospect, you're going to have to talk with them. So, yeah, I just think yep. the automation to, to help save a lot of time for selling time uh, for the sales development reps and enable them to focus more on the conversations they're going to have with prospects, and that's really what you want. Yeah, and, and it still doesn't take away from the fact that you, you did all of that stuff, marketing, sales, automation, but now here's a live person on the other end of the line, what do you say, and you got to then have that down pat, and that comes with then the sales uh, um, pitches and, and conversations and questioning. You know, it, it reminded me too, and you probably have know this stat or know this person, Marcus Sheridan, I read recently mm-hmm. that he was referencing a statistic um, where it was something to the effect of when he ran his pool company, he started noticing that um, out of X number of uh, appointments set, so many of them would cancel or so many of them would buy. And he started looking at the correlation and discovered that the people that had gone and clicked through a certain number, and I want to say 30 or 40 or 50 pages of his website, and his website was all educational-based content. Mm -hmm, When mm -hmm. those people were, you know, astronomically higher chance to set the appointment and and make it and keep it and then also to buy. The people that clicked, hit one page, booked the appointment, they were more likely to cancel or not buy. So can you speak to that content marketing aspect, which then again sets the stage for the automation tools to make it easier to connect, but then we got to get that either belly to belly or phone call to phone call. Yeah, well, I'm, so what you're really describing, what, what and I've heard Marcus talk on a number of occasions, is, is that is really lead scoring. And so increasingly, the, if you differentiate the marketing automation tools from the sales automation tools, say this class of marketing automation tools that companies are using in conjunction with their content marketing, is what they're going to do is they're going to track people's activities. And based on the number of times, it could be the number of times they engage with your content or the specific um, – you know, items of content that they engage with, you're going to give them a score for each of those touches. And when the cumulative score based number of touches or interactions reaches a certain point, then that oftentimes will transition from being what people call a marketing qualified lead to a sales qualified lead. And that will get forwarded to the sales development team to follow up with. In that case, then the customer has basically demonstrated, as you talked about with Marcus, a higher level of interest, an ongoing level of interest, an increasing level of interest and engagement with your content, which is signaling that, yeah, now is the time to pick up the phone and call them because we're more likely, A, to get hold of them. And once getting hold of them, more likely they'll turn into a qualified prospect. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, well, and, that, the other- that, and that's really at the heart of all the content marketing is, is not just to have the content out there, but be able to track engagement with it on the part of the prospect and use that as a yep. data point to say, now is the time to call them from a sales standpoint. And that takes automation, but yep. that doesn't. Uh, delete the insertion of the human element because no. for for many B two B companies, you know, like selling software, what's the price point there? 
20,000, 50, 100,000 into the millions. And you're never going to have a buy now button for that where they get led through the process and buy now and pull out your credit card. Um, if you're selling, you know, a $50 product, maybe so, but most B2B sales, you want that content marketing, inbound lead, um, uh, lead scoring, and then the automation kicks in to where now you can connect and, and make that, that sales presentation. So I, I just think well, that I think, too many well, I think people... That also- I was going to say, just to fill it in, so it's even in the business to consumer, I mean, there are multiple examples of, of very successful online marketing companies that you know, are selling products for $100, $200, $300 that will always do the closing with a person. You know, they'll get yep. leads and then they, they have call centers that are calling people to follow up on that. Yep. And they find a much higher conversion rate than waiting for people to, to, uh, you know, hit a buy now button and so on. So I think without a doubt across across the spectrum is unless you're set selling something really, really inexpensively, you're always getting a higher conversion rate if you insert a person into the process. Yeah, that's massive, and I think that too many people see the shiny object of internet marketing, and they feel like, let me set up a funnel and put a buy now button, and Yahoo, I can go retire to the beaches of the world, and, and that just doesn't happen. It's it, when you hear it, they're they're one off stories, but you got to insert that person, um, whether it's it, and and I would submit that it's got to be the leader first for the smaller size companies until they get the process down, the feel down, then they can train someone and watch them and coach them, and now all of a sudden they can replicate what's being done to free up the leader to do more higher value uh, uh, tasks. Exactly. Exactly. Well, you know, as you can imagine, I think we've covered a half of one point of, of sales speak, so we could probably continue talking for about four and a half more hours. Um, but let's go ahead and just wrap up by saying what's, uh, what's the best way that people can learn more about you, your business, your books, and, and uh, what's the best way they can reach you? Sure. So uh, come to my, my website, andypaul.com. And yeah, I also have a, a podcast. I, I post a daily podcast, a half hour interview show about uh, sales and marketing uh, topics that I uh, really encourage people to come get involved with. And you can find that again on my website, andypaul.com. Click on the podcast button. Uh, people would like to contact me. Uh, best email to address is andy at zero time selling.com. And that's all one word, zero, Z-E-R-O, T-I-M-E, selling.com. And uh, follow me on Twitter. And my handle is at Zero Time Selling. And please connect with me on LinkedIn. Super. So thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful learning some of your tools and techniques. Thank you, Andy. Hey, thanks, Mike. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.